Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. So we appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Welcome to the new studio, by the way. If you've been in exam roomy for some time, we're still piecing this together, but we're very excited about the new background. Uh, I want to say today that school is in session, my friend. The Dean of Nutrition is in the house. Dr. Neil Barnard is here to answer your questions. So if there's something on your mind that you would like to ask Dr. Barnard, you see him right there. Hi, Dr. Barnard. Hey there, Jack. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So glad that you're here, and I know that you're ready to take some questions. So if you do do have a question for Dr. Barnard, go ahead and post that in the comment section or the chat box. You can even tweet it to us using the hashtag exam room live, and we will get to as many questions as we possibly can today. Already some great ones coming in. People wondering, what are the best sources of iodine if you're eating a plant-based diet? Dr. Barnard has the skinny on that. Also, how much B12 do we need as we get older? Do the levels change? We're going to dive into that. And then the big question about processed food food, how many nutrients, how much of that nutritional value is lost when a food becomes processed? We're going to be diving into that today as well, plus a whole lot more. So go ahead and get your questions into the chat right now so we can get as many answered as possible as we open up the doctor's mailbag. So let's go ahead right now and do just that. Dr. Barnard, you ready for the first question, my friend? You bet. This one comes to us from a viewer by the name of CRS. They are wondering what are the best sources of iodine if you're eating a plant-based diet? Ah, great question. Um, so that people understand what we're talking about, iodine is an element that your thyroid uses to make thyroid hormone, and that gives you energy. And if you're low in iodine, if you're not, if you're not getting enough, um, as a lot of people are, you're not making enough thyroid hormone, your energy will be low, your weight might be creeping up a little bit, and you're, you're, you're just not going to feel like quite like yourself. That's hypothyroidism. Uh, so you need iodine, where do you get it? Um, the easy source, of course, is iodized salt. Back in 1924, the Morton Company started selling these blue canisters with the girl with the umbrella. You know what I'm talking about? That's iodized salt. That, that really pretty much wiped out iodine deficiency. Uh, nowadays, modern people are eating Himalayan salt or sea salt, and it is, it is not iodized, unless it specifically says so on the label. If, if it doesn't, it's not. Um, Food-wise, the by far the, the coolest source, I'm gonna say, is seaweeds, sea vegetables. So you're at the sushi bar. You're having your vegan uh, sushi roll, cucumber roll, asparagus roll, the nori wrap, is a great source of iodine, and that's actually true for all seaweeds. So your seaweed salad and so forth. Um, if you are unsure about your iodine intake, um, about a, maybe a third of a teaspoon or so of iodized salt will get you a long way toward your, your requirement. Um, you can also get um, iodine supplements. They're often sold as kelp, which of course is a, a sea vegetable. And the amount that you need per day is 150 micrograms. So you can take it from there. Um, don't overdo it. Um, overdoing it is a problem too. All right, let's uh, go ahead and take our next question. This comes to us from a viewer on Twitter using the hashtag exam room live. They're wondering, are unprocessed, unpreserved, or uncooked raw plant foods the most nutritious and how much of that nutrient value is lost during the processing process? Often... Uh, the less processed they are, the better. They, they, you know, if you have an apple, you don't need to turn it into applesauce and add sugar and stuff like that. That said, there are some things where they are better cooked and um, better off being processed. Um, the classic example is the tomato. Now, you can't beat a great, juicy, ripe, raw tomato. Except, researchers discovered probably 30 years ago that if you mush it up into salsa or uh, sauces or even even ketchup, it liberates the lycopene, L-Y-C-O-P-E-N-E, lycopene. That's this powerful antioxidant that reduces prostate cancer risk. So that, that got everybody thinking, gee, maybe there's something to be said 
for breaking down the cell membranes of plant foods and letting the nutrients out. Um, but I think your instincts are right. Generally speaking, the more it looks like the plant it came from, the better off you're gonna be. I'm gonna give you one other exception though, and that's the cruciferous vegetables. I think you're better off cooking them. Um, there are some natural toxins in them that, that, that are, are not gonna be a problem unless you eat a huge amount, but broccoli, cauliflower, kale, your digestive tract is gonna rebel if you have too much of them in their raw form. Can we take a second and talk a little bit about the difference between just processed food and ultra processed food? That seems to be kind of a new term that's been thrown around in the last couple of years. What is the difference between those two? Yeah, I'm not sure that there's an actual um, demarcation between the two, but sometimes people think of ultra processed foods are things where you're, you're, you're processing is partly disrupting the food. So I'll take a grain of wheat, I'll grind it up, I'll make spaghetti. Um, but what if in the process of making the spaghetti, I also remove all of the fiber? And what if I start adding things like egg and, and so forth? Now you're, you're talking about processing that's going way beyond just grinding something up. The reason that, that, that matters is our team and, and a number of others have looked at something that's, let, let's say it's spaghetti, pasta. Surprisingly enough, its effect on your blood sugar is not really so huge, particularly if it's al dente. So in research that we've done with people with type 2 diabetes, we let them eat pasta. Um, now that frightens people. They think, what do you mean white pasta? How can you have that it's so processed? Sure enough, but um, you take a look at a person's blood sugar and for many the effect is, is really uh, pretty minimal. Um, so, but, but, but I do think when we get into adding lots of um, unhelpful nutrients, um, particularly the coconut fat that goes in, um, and obviously things like when people add lard to to pureed beans and so forth. That's you could call that processing if you want, but it's just really ruining a an otherwise healthy food. All right, Oliver is checking in all the way from Cologne, Germany. He says, "Hey, Chuck, cool show. You're such a great source of inspiration for me as I continue to eat my low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet." Well, thank you, Oliver. That's very nice of you. Uh, he goes on to say that he has lost 44 pounds, Doctor Barnard. How about that? He's lost 44 pounds thank and no longer obese. Oliver, you are the man. His question for you, sir. I wonder if I am running too low on vitamin E. I get about three milligrams a day on average. Do I need to supplement? First of all, congratulations. That weight loss is terrific. And I'm sure everybody around you, including your physician, is pro they're probably really impressed. So congratulations on that. About vitamin E, it's it's really one of these things where it's hard to know if you're if you're if you're really low you don't really see deficiency states in in the clinic but um for an adult uh the usual recommended daily allowance is about 15 milligrams a day and if you've added it up and you're at three um on, on average well that's that is kind of on the low side um that said vitamin e hides in a lot of foods so when you're estimating the amount that you're getting you might not really find it very easy to know how much that varies from day to day. But what you can know is which foods have a lot of it. Vitamin E happens to be fat soluble. That's different from B12 and, and, and many other common vitamins. Vitamin E is, is soluble in fatty foods. What does that mean? There's a lot more in a nut than there is in an apple um, because it's fat soluble. So nuts and seeds have lots of it. If you Let's say you have an ounce of almond, something like that. Um, and, and by the way, an ounce is you, you pour it into your hand. And by the time it touches your finger, don't let it touch your fingers. Um, if it stops, stop at that point, just a small handful. That's about an ounce. And send it to a lab. They'll tell you there's about five milligrams of vitamin E there. Now, if you have two handfuls, it's 10. If you have three handfuls, it's 15. But that now, the, the problem now is you're getting into calories because oil has a lot of calories too. So um, I would suggest A, not supplementing unless a medical professional has specifically told you to because the fat soluble vitamins sometimes have toxicities. And B, uh, if you want to have some nuts or seeds as a good reliable vitamin E source, fair enough, but I would limit it to maybe about an ounce a day, something like that. 
All right, we just talked about vitamin E. Let's go ahead and talk about vitamin D. This question comes to us from John. He writes that he has low levels of vitamin D, but that he's confused because he's heard that taking the vitamin D, you may not absorb it properly and that it may actually wind up being harmful. What are your thoughts, Dr. Barnard, on supplementing with vitamin D? Um, I think for a lot of people, it actually is a good idea to supplement with vitamin D. And the reason is that vitamin D's natural source is the sunlight. But uh, and, the, and the human species began in Africa in a nice equatorial climate where sunlight was all around <laughs> every day, pretty much. Um, and because we've had the bad judgment to move to, move like, to places like Fargo, um, Saskatchewan, Alaska, places where the, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but, but the reality is there's not much vitamin D hitting your skin. You're not, the sunlight isn't hitting your skin, so the vitamin D isn't being formed. Uh, a supplement is a good idea. How much? Uh, for a, a, an adult, an average adult, about 2,000 IUs a day is the right amount. And that's not harmful, that's helpful. Um, you can get tested. The tests very often come back low. And, and you will wonder, is, can this be real? Are these tests being made by vitamin D supplement, supplement manufacturers? Hard to know. But supplementing is a good idea, it, unless you are getting regular sunlight on your face and hands, face and arms. Uh, let's stay aboard that vitamin train. Woo -woo. Uh, this is a question from John as well. He says that he's 68. Do I need more B12 than someone who is younger? Uh, you might. Um, older folks, um, I'm not going to say 68 is older folks, but you, you know, we're, we're getting up there. Um, <laughs> and if we are making less stomach acid, then it's harder for the body to pull vitamin B12 off of foods that it might be in, like meat, for example. So if you're a meat eater and you're older, it's hard, the lack of stomach acid is going to affect you, but hopefully you're not a meat eater. So that's not going to be such a big thing. Um, people on metformin, very commonly used for diabetes, uh, the metformin interferes with absorption. Okay, so those are kind of the, the reasons why a person might need to up it. But assuming you're not in those categories, uh, your recommended daily allowance is pretty much in the same ballpark as, as a younger person. It's around 2.4 micrograms per day. And if you go to the store, you'll discover they don't sell anything that small. They're all 100 micrograms or 200 or 500 or 1,000. And I would recommend getting the smallest one that they sell. If it's say 200 micrograms, get that, take that every day. Um, if the smallest one you can find is about a thousand, I would take that maybe every other day or every third day and your doctor can test your vitamin B12 levels. You don't have to have it tested every now and then, but if you're unsure, it's not a bad idea to get it tested at some point. Marissa, it sounds like she's trying to improve the diet of her family. My hat is off to her. Here is her question. Do I have to be super conscious about the amount of uh, food that I'm serving of everything for my kids? She says that they're four and seven years old, or as long as she offers them a variety of all things that are whole food, plant-based, will they be okay? Well, first of all, your kids are lucky to have you for a mom. That's just wonderful. Um, giving your kids healthful foods is such a, an enormous advantage. They may not appreciate it yet, but in a couple of decades when they look at their friends and the shape that their friends are, are getting into and they're gonna remember their mom looking after their, their nutrition, that's just fantastic. Okay, two rules. Um, the foods that are offered should include four groups, the fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans. It doesn't have to be every meal or, or even necessarily absolutely every day, but you want to feature all four of those food groups um, and, and the ones that your kids like. I mean, if, if they don't like broccoli, um, maybe they'll like um, other green vegetables. You pick the ones that they like. You don't arm wrestle with them about it. Second rule, make sure that your kids have a source of vitamin B12. Now, vitamin B12 is in every pediatric multiple vitamin. So it's in Flintstones and whatever, and that's fine. It's got you covered. Um, if you're not taking a multiple vitamin, do take a B12 supplement. Um, uh, that's, that you'll find at, at every health food store and every drug store. So have all each of those four food groups every day. I would not worry about the quantity as long as your kids are eating, um, as long as they're physically active, as long as their weight is going in the right direction, meaning they're gradually gaining weight as they get older um, and they get their B12, that's good. Where can you go wrong? Um, where parents run into trouble 
is with other people giving them unsolicited advice. Like, don't you think your child needs a little bit of meat now and then, or shouldn't your child have a, a glass of milk or whatever? Um, short answer is no, kids don't need those things. Um, the other area where we can get into trouble is that sometimes uh, foods that are marketed, um, veggie burgers and things, uh, although 90% of them are, are frankly fine, um, some of them now like the Impossible Burger, they've added so much coconut fat um, that it's a, a, a source of calories and B, it's gonna raise their cholesterol levels. So you wanna be cautious about some of the junk that's being marketed now. And, and when I say junk, what I mean is the Impossible Burger, it's not marketed for you, it's marketed for meat eaters. It's, it's designed to seduce a meat eater away and it's, that's good. But you are on a much, in a, in a healthier track. You're eating vegan foods and so you don't need that kind of stuff. So I hope that's, hope that's helpful. Once again, your, your kids will thank you for looking after their diets. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, they're going to pay a huge thank you to you. They will owe you a huge debt of, debt of gratitude. A matter of fact, Dr. Barnard, I recently had a conversation with Dr. Yami, um, you know, a pediatrician, and we were talking about how there is this misconception out there that a child can eat whatever they want and pay no penalty for it whatsoever. It's they have this fast metabolism. Of course they can eat whatever they want and they'll be fine. But what she was explaining is there is a price to pay. Even if it does come a number of years later, those seeds for heart disease and cancer and all of these chronic conditions that we talk about on this show so regularly, they are truly planted in our childhood years. In, in two ways. Um, the first, the obvious one is, is the tastes. If kids learn, the taste of bacon and sausage, then fast forward a couple of decades, that's when the doctor is saying that's what caused your cholesterol level to go up. And the patient then has trouble um, at that point ad adapting to a healthier diet. When your kids learn and learn to love the taste of healthy foods because that's all they grew up with, that's a huge advantage. But the other thing is that the, the whole idea that they can just burn off any junk they eat, completely untrue. And we learned this the hard way, I gotta tell you. Um, back in the Korean War and in the Vietnam War, kids, 18 year old kids were, were killed in battle. Autopsies on them showed that they had the arteries of older people. Um, despite the fact that they were in their late teens, um, eating burgers and hot dogs and cheese caused atherosclerotic changes in the coronary arteries at that young age. Um, and you see this, this kind of, I mean, these are always very grisly research studies when they do them, but, but researchers have looked at it, even younger kids, say killed in um, accidents and things like that. And they do find the artery changes occur very early in life. We see the same thing with diabetes. Uh, teenagers typically don't develop uh, type two diabetes, although unfortunately now some are but you do see the beginnings of prediabetes because the fat in the foods that they're eating, I'm talking about a typical meat eating kid, uh, the fat in the meat and dairy products and fried junk they're eating finds its way into their muscle cells and into their liver cells. It causes insulin resistance. It's interfering with their cellular machinery and they get the beginnings of diabetes as teenagers. Now they don't get a diagnosis typically for another 20, 30 years. But what kids eat is, is physically changing their bodies in childhood. And, and one of the real shockers is uh, lower back pain. Some of the first arteries to be uh, severely damaged are the ones that go to the lower back. I'm talking about the lumbar arteries. Classic atherosclerosis that came from eating eggs, bacon, uh, chicken, fish, meat, uh, these sources of cholesterol and fat block off the arteries in different parts of the body at different times, but, but the first to go are typically the ones in the lower back. And what that means is that if you don't give your lower back an adequate blood supply, the discs become fragile and you end up with lower back disc disease as a result of a bad diet causing the arteries to be compromised. I know that sounds amazing, uh, but this, uh, this research was done in Scandinavia countries decades ago and it's, it's helped us to understand quite a lot of things about how the body um, is affected by a bad diet. So there you go. 
Yeah, plant those seeds early. I, I did not know that. That's that's interesting. I'm going to go ahead and look up that paper. Um, next question comes to us from Debbie. This is a popular one. Smoothies, man. Smoothies are everybody loves a smoothie in the morning. Debbie, I have a green smoothie every morning with fruit and rolled oats. Am I still getting the benefits of fiber and nutrients or is that smoothie considered a processed food? Uh, it's both. You are getting the benefits of fiber. The, the rolled oats have plenty of fiber in them. And, you know, the fact that it's mushed up by your blender doesn't take the fiber out. It's still there. Same with any vegetables and fruits that you put in. So perfectly fine. Um, you are getting benefits, even though it, it is, yes, processed. The only the only thing to, to think about with, with smoothies is that because it's so pre-digested, it's sort of like your blender chewed it up for you. It goes down the hatch pretty fast. Um, once in a while, that means that we've swallowed it, not giving our satiety re uh, response to it enough time to kick in. So that means we're eating more calories faster. Um, that's the only danger. But if, if you're having your smoothie, it's non-dairy, and you're having all the good things that go in it, and you discover your weight isn't going up, off you go. It's perfectly fine. Follow-up question from Byron at 1208, I've been told that frozen fruits and vegetables retain a high amount of nutrition. Those, of course, staple ingredients of smoothies. Byron wants to know, fresh is always better, but is frozen still good? Frozen is still good. And, and, and in fact, uh, fresh isn't always better. Um, think of it this way. Um, something's fresh, picked in the field, transported in a truck, ends up in a warehouse, gets to the store, sits there for three, four days, and then you finally get it, and a couple days after that, you eat it. Um, some of the nutrients are starting to dissipate. Frozen, picked in the field, brought to the plant, instantly frozen, and the nutrients are, are sealed in. And they stay that way in your freezer until you cook it. So uh, frozen and fresh are generally considered equivalent, and there are some times where I would say frozen is probably better. Um, it's better in comparison with a fresh, uh, variety that sat around for a long time before it was consumed. Uh, Dr. Bernard, you and I live, work, operate in a world where we are steeped in data and research, and it just seems to come in by the truckload every single day. But Linda also has a great point at 1208. She says, at what point are we micromanaging our diets to the extreme? It seems like almost too much information is circulating for us to, to just create more and more worry. If you're just eating a whole food plant-based diet, is that good enough? Um, I, I, I hear you and I, th I think you're right. I think in some cases people dissect things a little bit too much. Um, and the rules really ought to be simple. Have the new four food groups that I mentioned, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans. Keep the oils low and especially like the coconut oil and the palm oil, eliminate those. Um, don't eat that. Don't forget your B12. Um, if you're doing those things, you're, you're, you're doing pretty well. You don't necessarily have to worry about which foods are highest in L-glutathione. <laughs> Liz has a question here also at 1208. Wants to know what your feelings are on whole grain bread. Is that not considered a whole food or is it too processed? Is it still getting good nutrients and fiber? It's, it's fine. You know, I'm hearing kind of a theme today is, is, is it's easy to get freaked out about processing. I think Processing is not a terrible thing. It depends on what's, on what's happening in the process, but if a person takes grains, grinds them up and makes bread out of them, that's generally speaking perfectly fine. It beats the heck out of a drumstick um, or a hunk of cheese or something like that. Um, so yes, I'm gonna give it a thumbs up. Stephanie, 1224, jumping right around. I'm trying to lose weight and lower my blood pressure. Should I avoid seeds and nuts? And if so, should I worry about vitamin E? Yes, uh, I would avoid seeds and nuts right now. If, if weight loss is a goal, you'll discover that nuts and seeds interfere with it. Um, and this doesn't have to be forever and ever and ever, but you, you'll, just, you'll discover that your weight loss is faster if the nuts and seeds are set to the side. Um, your vitamin E intake will be lower, but, it's, but other, other foods do provide some vitamin E, so I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Question from 1226, is cooking with coconut cream okay? Talk to us about coconut cream. Um, look at the label when I'm presuming you're buying a commercial product, look at the label and the thing, what you want, the thing you want to look at is saturated fat. And if it is some anywhere north of zero, I would, <laughs> I would, 
you, you don't you don't need it. Um, the, the coconut manufacturers are are eager, and coconut enthusiasts are eager to say that it won't hurt you. Um, no, the, the, the saturated fat in a coconut will raise your cholesterol. That will increase your risk of heart disease. And the fact that somebody's got groves of coconut trees and they are finding ways to sell them to people and to market them um, doesn't make them healthy. So I would, I, I would really be extremely cautious about both coconut oil and palm oil. Look for foods that don't have them. Rob is an avid exerciser, wants to know what your thoughts are on eating a whole food plant-based diet when you exercise intensely four to five times a week. It's great to do. It's the greatest thing. Um, first of all, exercise is super. Um, it is great in every possible way. And the, 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 the fuel that your body needs is not pork, chicken, beef, dairy. Um, exercising muscles need the same fuel that non-exercising muscles need. Um, plus, you're going to need a lot of extra calories in the form of carbohydrate. Uh, carbohydrate and natural sugars build glycogen. That those, that those are the spare batteries in your liver and in your muscles that allow you to go out exercising tomorrow morning. Um, so grains, beans, vegetables, fruits, those are going to be great. Um, your, your body will use a little extra protein, not a lot, uh, but it, it uses it for... Um, for rebuilding any tissue damage that you may have had. Um, but along with the extra food that you're gonna be eating, uh, you'll get extra protein along with it. So you should be just fine. How about this for a name? Extraordinary On Purpose is watching us on YouTube. Wants to know, can starch from carrots, potatoes, rice, and the like cause artery blockage? I know someone who is vegan, but tries to avoid these as well as avocado because they think that it affects their arteries and he feels tightness in his heart area. Uh, you can't feel atheros you, you cannot feel atherosclerosis as it forms. Um, you can sometimes feel when things go really badly, like when you're having a heart attack. But no, that uh, that's unlikely to be the case. If the tightness in his chest is angina, that's chest pain. That means you've got established atherosclerosis. It doesn't wax and wane with each meal um, or something like that. Um, generally speaking, starchy foods are great. They're they're the they're a, they're the mainstay of a healthy menu that brings you uh, calories that you need to eat. Um, that said, if you're eating a lot of sugar um, and really refined starch, um, white bread, for example, for some people, their triglycerides will go up a little bit because the body is turning that um, starch into triglyceride. And you'll see that'll spike. But the more that you're having low glycemic index foods, uh, and ordinary vegetables and fruits and beans and whole grains, uh, your triglycerides will come down and, and all and your other numbers are going to be better too. Barb checking in at 1227. This is a big question for a lot of people. She's wondering what are the best foods to eat for weight loss and what are the ones that you should stay away from? Boy, we could spend a whole hour talking about this one, huh? Yeah, we, we sure could. But, you know, our team has studied exactly that question. And luckily, the answers are, are pretty simple. Best foods for weight loss are the ones that are high in carbohydrate and fiber and extremely low in fat. Why, why is that important? Fat, this will be on the test. Fat has nine calories in every gram. A gram of fat gives you nine calories that you will absorb and store. Every gram of carbohydrate Malign them well all, as much as you want to. A gram of carbohydrate has only four calories, less than half in that you'll find in fat. And that's why when people eat high carbohydrate diets, plant-based diets, they are um, pretty much across the board skinnier than the people who are afraid of carbohydrate and aren't eating it and are digging into fatty foods. So the foods that are best for weight loss, whole grains, beans, vegetables, fruits. Keep the oily foods and, oil, and, of course, all the animal products out of your diet. Don't forget your vitamin B12. Lace up your sneakers. That's a good thing to do, too. Um, not that the exercise itself burns off a huge number of calories. Uh, every mile that you jog or, or even walk is going to burn about 100 calories, so not much. But the beauty of exercise is, number one, when you're exercising, you can't really eat a bowl of ice cream. And secondly... Exercising gives you just a little bit of mental feel good that makes you just that much less likely to look to food 
for your feel good. So eat those healthy four groups, add some exercise to it. That's a good regimen. So fiber comes up quite frequently when we do talk about weight loss. And I think someone who is just beginning their weight loss journey uh, may say, well, Metamucil has fiber. That's got carbohydrates and it has a picture of a whole grain on the package. Is Metamucil, Metamucil and things like that the way to go to get your fiber? Um, it won't hurt you, but, but no, you don't need to go there. Um, it's, it's a tragedy. You go into the drugstore and you see aisle after aisle of fiber supplements. Um, Metamucil is just a, a seed fiber that they sell to people who are eating foods that don't have fiber in them. That's its whole point. Um, if you eat vegetables, they all have fiber. If you eat fruits, they have fiber. If you eat beans and whole grains, you got lots of fiber. So if you eat cheese, yogurt, chicken, fish, they don't have any fiber. So Metamucil says, well, why don't you just add Metamucil to your chicken and it's going to balance out. It's, it's, it's a product that the vast majority of people would never need if they're simply eating plant-based foods. It won't you know, hurt you, but you shouldn't need it. You know, when also when it comes to weight loss, one of the foods that are really difficult for people to get out of their diet are those sweets. And people think, well, let's turn to those natural sweeteners then, and that will help us out. So somebody now is wondering, is agave nectar a healthy substitute for regular sugar? Um, I'm not a huge expert on, on the various sweeteners, but from what I have seen, agave is fine. Um, but that said, at the risk of sounding a little heretical, I think even a little bit of natural sugar is probably okay. Um, one teaspoon of sugar has what, 15 calories? Or like, who cares? Um, where we run into trouble with sugar is sugar dissolves and it dissolves into cookie dough and it dissolves into soft drinks. And then you end up with 16 teaspoons of it. And, and so the quantity has gotten away from you. But if a person has a little bit of sweetness in something, even from, from regular sugars, uh, if, the, if the amount is, is modest, the, the contribution to health issues is, is really nil. JL, just a comment here that's important uh, enough to share. I, I get annoyed, though, when the media just promotes lengthy, strenuous workouts and mentions nothing about diet when it comes to weight loss. Amen to that, JL. Uh, I have found as far as keeping the weight off that nutrition is 90% of the game. And it sounds like, Dr. Barnard, that's something you definitely agree with. Yeah. Um, go run for a mile. Go, go, go to a gym. Uh, run, run for a mile on a treadmill and push a little button that tells you how many calories you burned. It's about 100. Um, if after your, your sweaty workout, you go and, and pick up a Coca-Cola, the 20 ounce Coke has 250 calories in it. So wait a minute, I burned hundred, but I drank 250. Uh, the point is this, your comment is spot on. If we are not also looking at what we're eating, the exercise alone is not gonna really help us. But exercise is a good thing and it should accompany a healthy diet, not try to replace it. And where we, where I think where people are really in trouble is the college football player who thinks I can, I can burn off all that cholesterol. I need to have meaty thighs. So, so they're, they're eating really unhealthy foods with the misunderstanding that somehow that cholesterol will, will burn off. It, it doesn't. Um, the cholesterol doesn't burn off. The effects on your arteries does not change despite the fact that your muscles might be, be built up. Your arteries are being damaged by that and you can't exercise that away. Let's uh, switch, uh, go upstairs here, talk about the brain for a little bit. Becca checking in at 1234. We have time for just a couple more questions. So Becca, we're going to slide yours in here. Wants to know, what are your thoughts on high starch, low fat vegan diets versus a high fat diet when it comes to brain health to prevent cognitive decline? Okay. Um, in Chicago, back in 1993, a, a really important study got started called the Chicago Health and Aging Project. Um, they rounded up thousands of people. They tracked them year after year after year. They looked at what they ate. And they looked at who stayed mentally clear. And the first thing that really showed up loud and clear is that those people who avoided saturated fat were, they, their risk of Alzheimer's was cut by about two thirds. Um, what's saturated fat? Number one source, dairy. Number two source, meat. So the people who were minimizing dairy and meat 
and minimizing the bad fat that's in it, it had a huge benefit. They were, their risk of developing cognitive decline much lower. Um, we saw similar findings in the Adventist health studies that have gone on. Uh, as you know, Adventists vary in diet a lot, but they're generally health conscious. The health conscious meat eaters have a much more rapid decline in cognitive health compared to the health conscious vegetarians or vegans. So no, the, the data, I think we need more and more study, but the data are compelling enough that it's a really good idea to certainly avoid the animal fats. Coconut oil is also going to be um, in that category because it's it's a high saturated fat, same with palm oil. And let's wrap up today uh, talking about uh, pregnancy here. Earlier in the show, we talked about feeding kids a heart healthy or a whole food plant based diet when they are young, but born. But Sheena here at 1236 is wondering for pregnant women, what type of plant based foods are best to focus on? Oh, I'm so glad that you're um, interested in that. And by the way, um, let me tip my hat to my good friend, Jean Schubacher and Dr. Deborah Shapiro, who have started a program called Pregnancy Advantage. And I know you've talked about it, uh, Chuck. Um, and they go into this in great detail. So have a look at them. Uh, but in a nutshell, um, when it, I'm not the first one who told you this. When you're pregnant, you're eating for two. One of you is very small, so you don't have to eat a whole lot more, but you want to eat in a healthful way. And that means plant-based foods, just like we've been talking about, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, and vitamin B12, because your baby needs it too. And women who are doing this before pregnancy, before conception, have the biggest advantage. Eating this way during pregnancy is associated with, we need more study of this too, but the studies that we have show that the birth complications appear to be much less frequent in vegan women compared to meat-eating women. Um, and then kids do great when they are breastfed and the foods that come in as solid foods when the time comes are vegan foods and B12 of course has to be part of it all along the way with the prenatal vitamins and, and the vitamins given to kids too. So you're on the right track. Let's go ahead and close up the doctor's mailbag for today, but with the caveat in that in just moments, I will be interviewing Cyrus Kambada from Mastering Diabetes, going to be talking all about diabetes here on the exam room, going to be taping that episode. So if you have a question that you would like to ask Cyrus, go ahead and post that in the comments or the chat box right now, and I will do my best to make sure that that question gets asked on that upcoming episode. But Dr. Barnard, that is all the time that we have for today's show. So I want to thank you so very much as always for joining us, my friend. Greatly appreciate your time. You bet. Thank you, Chuck. All right. And again, if we didn't get to your question, we will go ahead and save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So stay with us. Before we go, uh, I, this is a really cool announcement. You know, Heart Health Month just wrapped up at the end of February, but of course your heart beats year round. So I am happy now to announce that registration is now open for the Physicians Committee's next virtual plant-based health immersion. And this one, you guessed it, focused entirely on your heart. So I want for you to join leading nutrition experts, save the state, Saturday, April 17th, beginning at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific for an immersive virtual experience. So at this experience, you will learn how plant-based nutrition can improve your heart health and tons of other chronic conditions. And if you register right now through March 14th, you can save $20 off the admission price. Just head over to pcrm.org slash immersion to get your savings. Now, of course, the big question, well, who is talking? What am I going to learn? Well, you're going to learn more information than you could ever possibly hope for when it comes to your heart. As a matter of fact, you're going to walk away as an honorary cardiologist after this. It's so great. Amazing presentations that are high on information, but definitely low on cholesterol. Doctors, dietitians, nurses, even going to have some live cooking demonstrations so that you can learn on the fly in the kitchen and implement everything that you're learning that day right away that night with your dinner. Plus, you're going to get the opportunity to ask the experts your questions just like you did today with Dr. Barnard. So pcrm.org slash immersion is the place to go to sign up today. Save $20 through March 14th and the piece de resistance, by the way. You're also going to hear the story from a doctor who radically improved their own heart health by changing their diet, focusing on a low-fat, 
whole food, plant-based diet, and now their heart beating as healthfully as ever. So cool. PCRM.org slash immersion is the place to go to register. And that, my friend, is all the time that we have for today. I want to say thank you one more time to Dr. Barnard for joining us and to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. Thank you guys, as always. And to you, my exam roomies, thank you so very much for spending some of your day with us and raising your nutrition IQ. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again on Friday. But until then, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based. <laughs>